With the specialization of knowledge that has occurred post-enlightenment, many disciplines have developed their own vocabularies. Before would-be students can make progress learning the logic and rhetoric of an area of study, they must first become accustomed to its grammar. In terms of some of the topics that are within the purview of this channel, that includes gaining familiarity with words such as esoteric, gnostic, hermetic, mystic, neoplatonic, occultic, and much else besides. These words often lie outside the scope of what one encounters in a largely secularized primary and secondary public education, and yet they are used liberally, both individually and in combination, in explorations of alternative spirituality, whether one is interested in the contemporary scene or in its history. So in this presentation, I'm going to tackle and try to clarify and distinguish 10 words. The list is, to an extent, personal. These terms were some of those that gave me trouble in my own reading. Therefore, this list is one that I wish that I had found myself earlier in my investigations. In-depth treatments of each of these 10 words, or more accurately, the ideas they name, will be the subject of follow-up videos, provided there's interest. For the time being, and in order to ensure that this isn't 10 hours long, I will merely provide sketches. That said, here is my list of 10 arcane words that are easily confused. Number one, Neoplatonism. Like many of the words on this list, Neoplatonism arguably refers to a family of related views rather than to a single outlook. Suffice it to say that Neoplatonism is, first and foremost, a philosophy. To be sure, it has religious overtones and implications for theology, that is, the study of God. And those who adopt a thoroughgoing Neoplatonic perspective are frequently inclined whether antecedently or consequently, toward mysticism, which word we will look at in a few minutes. But Neoplatonism arose out of the thought and writing of Plato, who is one of the most famous philosophers to have ever lived. Moreover, Plato founded a school called the Academy, dedicated to the study of philosophy. The primary originators and early expositors of Neoplatonism came out of this school, chiefly Plotinus, Porphyry, Iamblichus, and Proclus, and they are, present YouTube video notwithstanding, more likely to be mentioned in philosophy classes than in any other context. The most prominent philosophical writing in this category is known as the Enneads, a word that in Greek means the nines, and refers to the fact that the document, based on Plotinus's thought, as edited and arranged by Porphyry, is comprised of six groups of nine treatises. An important distinguishing feature of Neoplatonic thought is that reality, that is absolutely everything, from being all the way down to non-being, is situated along a sort of hierarchy. At the very top of this chain of being is the One, about which we can know and say virtually nothing. However, the One emanates or radiates being in such a way as to create three lower realms of intellect, soul, and matter. For this reason, Neoplatonism is sometimes regarded as veering close to pantheism, or the idea that literally all that exists just is part of God. In any case, these lower worlds and their occupants are deficient, both ethically and ontologically, that is, in terms of their measure of existence. So, the sensitive Neoplatonist will desire to return to the One via a process of ascending up through the higher spheres on the hierarchy. Neoplatonism had a profound impact both on traditional and alternative religion. Arguably, the Latin Catholic Church Father, St. Augustine, had a significant Platonic and Neoplatonic orientation. Similarly, Christians in the Byzantine Empire, notably Michael Selas, formed a belt of transmission for Neoplatonism into the High Middle Ages. Around the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453, Neoplatonism was communicated to the West by Greek emissaries and expatriates, such as Gemistus Pletho and Cardinal Bizarian. Although traces of this Neoplatonic current are detectable in such people as the German-born Nicholas of Cusa, an especial concentration arose in Italy. Among these important Italians were those, like Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola, who were in Florence. Later, this included people a little further afield, such as the Venetian Franciscus Patricius. There was a curious intellectual pipeline between Italy and England, where in the 17th century, 
a loose confederation of diverse thinkers would develop a version of Platonism that was largely divested of its earlier obsession with Hermeticism, which word we will look at in a moment. This English movement was associated particularly with Cambridge University and included, principally, Ralph Cudworth, Henry Moore, and Benjamin Whichcote. However, Hermetic Neoplatonic influences are detectable in the thinking of philosopher Giordano Bruno, who influenced the German polymath Gottfried Leibniz, as well as in the speculations of Swedish mystic Emanuel Swedenborg. Number two, Gnosticism. As a term, Gnosticism was coined by the Cambridge Platonist scholar Henry Moore. As a system, Gnosticism, by contrast, and despite numerous similarities with Neoplatonic philosophy, is perhaps best characterized as a theology. To be precise, it is an often dizzying array of competing theologies. Of course, Gnostic thought can be analyzed and explicated philosophically, but many of the primary exponents of Gnosticism were either regarded, in their own times or now, as theologians, or else they were encountered in religious contexts. For example, Simon Magus, sometimes described as the founder of Gnosticism, was himself a biblical figure. You can read about him and his confrontation with Jesus' Apostle Peter in the 8th chapter of the 5th book of the New Testament titled The Acts of the Apostles. Or again, Valentinus, an important 2nd century Gnostic who lent his name to a system known as Valentinianism, was a theologian who may at one time have even been a candidate for the role of bishop in the nascent establishment Christian church. Much the same description could be given of other relevant personalities, such as Basilides, Marcion, and the later Persian prophet, Manny. Writings representative of Gnosticism include an array of ancient books. Collectively, these are termed the Gnostic Gospels. They include the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Seth, and the Gospel of Truth. Due to the heavy, albeit heterodox, Christian flavor of Gnosticism, it is often called a Christian heresy. Like Neoplatonism, many forms of Gnosticism described reality as a series of overlapping spheres, and Gnostics often advanced a version of the doctrine of emanation. But unlike Neoplatonism, which tends to be very monistic, that is, it holds that all existing things are somehow emanations of the One, Gnosticism is explicitly dualistic. To put it another way, Gnostics held that reality was composed of two irreducible components, matter and spirit. Matter is the province of evil, spirit is associated with, and strives for, the good. The problem is that humans, or at least some humans, are spirits trapped in bodily material form. This situation of celestial souls unnaturally relegated to the mundane world was frequently blamed on an entity, sometimes associated with Plato's Demiurge, which had creative powers, but a foolish, imperfect, or even malevolent disposition. This character was sometimes further identified with the God of the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible. This identification occurs, for example, in Marcionism. For elect humans, the path of freedom and redemption is to free these imprisoned divine sparks from the matter. This process can only begin when a person acquires this hidden information about humanity's true nature. This knowledge is what is meant by the word gnosis, which is a bit like the Eastern religious notion of enlightenment. Gnosticism crops up repeatedly in studies of those movements that were deemed heretical by the medieval church. Priscillianism, Paulicianism, Bogomilism, Catharism, and so on are all usually classified as species of Gnosticism. Additionally, the theological speculations of the offbeat early modern mystic Jakob Berma are sometimes characterized as Gnostic-like, and Gnosticism is sometimes said to be the inspiration for the cryptic letter G that frequently appears inside the Freemasonic compass and square emblem. The 19th century occult revival, which we will continually remark upon, gave rise in part to manifestly Gnostic-themed institutions, such as the Gnostic Church, a major restatement or revival of Gnosticism occurred within the Theosophical Society. Founded in 1875 by H. P. Blavatsky, Henry Steele Alcott, William Kwan Judge, and others. This organization in turn influenced the creation of several Gnostic offshoots, including G. R. S. Mead's Quest Society, as well as the Ariosophy of Austrian occultists Guido von Liszt 
and Jörg Lanz von Lebenfels. Gnosticism was also an important facet of the 19th century occult revival in France, which phenomenon we'll describe more fully in a few minutes. With input from British Magus and Ordo Templi Orientis member Aleister Crowley, the current eventually coalesced into the Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica, that is, the Gnostic Catholic Church, the creation of which is attributed to Jules Duanel. It also shows up in more academic contexts, for example, in the process theology of people like Hans Jonas. Process theology was inspired by and emerged out of the process philosophy of British mathematician and theorist Alfred North Whitehead. Number three, Hermeticism. Gnosticism and Neoplatonism both seem to have arisen in the Greco-Roman world, though Gnosticism may have had some Jewish antecedents. In general, these systems were part of a proliferation of worldviews that characterized the Hellenistic and early Roman periods. Part of the reason for this intellectual and spiritual volatility was the introduction of foreign ideas into Greek thought. Due to increased trade and imperial expansion, Greeks came into contact with Oriental philosophical concepts as well as with the mythologies and religions of other major people groups. At the time, this certainly would have included the beliefs and practices of ancient Egypt and ancient Persia, but also possibly of India. Our third difficult word, Hermeticism, designates an additional set of ideas that likewise originated during this tumultuous interval, and that also represented a blending of Egyptian and Greco-Roman mythology. The fountainhead of Hermeticism was the legendary Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes Trismegistus was in the first place a composite of the Egyptian gods Tehuti, or Thoth, and Hermes Mercury from classical mythology. However, later Hermeticists would further link this fabled character with the Hebrew patriarch Enoch and the Islamic prophet Idris. Sometimes these figures are conflated or identified while other times they are imagined to stand in a great sequence of initiates, passing down a wisdom tradition. In this latter case, Hermes was seen as a teacher who conveyed his secret teachings to various philosophers and sages, including Orpheus, Pythagoras, to whom I dedicated an entire video, and even Plato. The name Hermes Trismegistus means thrice great Hermes, or Hermes who is three times great. The reference here is understood to be Hermes' mastery of the three subjects that were variously called the Hermetic Arts or the Hermetic Sciences. The three are typically enumerated as alchemy, astrology, and magic. The thing to notice, I think, is that these disciplines are, in the first place, very practical, meaning that they are bound up with practices, as opposed to just armchair speculation about the universe. For example, Alchemy deals in chemical formulas and in the manipulation of physical substances. In fact, alchemy was a forerunner of what we think of as modern chemistry. Astrology depends upon calculations of planet and star positions that in the ancient world would have been made by hand. And magic, also called theurgy, frequently employs material objects and elaborate rituals and spells. A magician actually has to do or say certain things in order to affect results. All these aspects of Hermeticism, arguably, held the promise of empowering practitioners to influence the world and people around them. In other words, they were practiced to bring about tangible results, and not simply to gain knowledge for its own sake, or even for the sake of individual illumination. Therefore, Hermeticism is intensely, and I'll even say primarily, practical whereas both Gnosticism and Neoplatonism are, to a large extent anyway, theoretical. That said, various individuals may have had both practical and theoretical interests. For instance, you find that the Neo-Pythagorean philosopher Apollonius of Tiana was said to have been a wonder worker in addition to a philosopher. He was, so to speak, both a doer and a thinker. And this combination of theory and practice also characterizes certain kinds of Neoplatonism such as the theurgy-infused variety that started with Iamblichus. Similarly, it is conceivable that certain forms of Gnosticism also crisscrossed with Hermeticism. For example, the 3rd to 4th century figure Zosimus of Panopolis was also known as both an alchemist and a Gnostic. Additionally, the rich cache of documents discovered at Nag Hammadi in Egypt reveal Gnostic Gospels preserved side by side with the Asclepius 
a key treatise in the Corpus Hermeticum. It appears that Hermetic thinking and the Hermetica had a wide appeal. This is possibly due, at least partly, to the fact that in and of itself the lore surrounding Hermes Trismegistus is far less of a complete worldview than the other two systems previously surveyed. It's more of a collection of stories. But Hermetic practices and lore could also be explained in terms of, and integrated into, more sophisticated philosophical or theological systems, such as those built by Gnostics or Neoplatonists. Hermeticism was a feature of the thinking of Renaissance figures such as the previously mentioned Marsilio Ficino, as well as of Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, Francesco Giorgi, and Paracelsus. It was explicitly incorporated into the 17th century Rosicrucian movement by its mysterious apologists, including, in the category of possible authors, the German Protestants Johann Valentine Andreae, Christopher Besoldus, and Tobias Hess, and, in the category of sympathizers, the English Paracelsian doctor Robert Flood and the Lutheran alchemists Heinrich Kunroth and Michael Meyer. These Rosicrucians exercised a seminal influence on Englishmen such as the Lord High Chancellor Francis Bacon and antiquarian Elias Ashmole, as well as on Italian noblemen, whether real or pretended, like Raimondo di Sangro, Prince of San Severo, and the occultist and socialite Giuseppe Balsamo, who styled himself Count Alessandro Cagliostro. These colorful figures seem to have helped pass the torch of Hermeticism onto what, in the 18th century, would develop into Freemasonry. Finally, several 19th century Masons would go on to found Hermetic-infused orders during the 19th and 20th centuries. Various incarnations of these Rosicrucian societies, or Societas Rosicruciana, were established in England, Scotland, and in the United States. And we cannot neglect to mention the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, organized by William Robert Woodman, William Wynne Westcott, and Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers. Apparently along a somewhat separate trajectory, 19th century reputed sex magician and alchemist Pascal Beverly Randolph started his own Rosicrucian fraternity in the 1850s. And then, in the 20th century, H. Spencer Lewis started the ancient mystical order of the Rosé Crucis, while Max Heindel would go on to found the Rosicrucian Fellowship. Number 4. Esotericism Recall that Hermeticism was centrally concerned with various applied disciplines, but saying that Hermeticism is mainly practical by no means implies that it had no theoretical aspects at all. To put it roughly, in order for Hermetic practices to be justified, to say nothing about their being likely to affect results, certain things would have to be true of the world. Codifying and stating these prerequisites is the purview of theoreticians. For instance, making no claims about the truth of the discipline, it's clear that an astrologer wouldn't be able to analyze someone's personality or predict her failures and successes, even in principle, unless the stars were somehow correlated with the subject's life. Thus, astrology requires that a correspondence exist between the celestial world and the everyday world of human experience. When one attempts to spell out these preconditions, one discovers that Hermeticism shares a few cosmological or metaphysical ideas with Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, and derivative systems. We can speak about some of these essential features in the abstract without getting bogged down with the details of any particular system. To do so, it is helpful to have a word handy, and the one name that is routinely applied to these underlying or overarching commonalities is esotericism. So what are some of these general qualities that are observed across a wide variety of philosophical religious systems, including Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and Hermeticism? According to the late British historian Nicholas Goodrick Clark, there are several hallmarks of esotericism. I have my own list of 10 that I may present in a separate video, but for now I'll list two. Firstly, we have the existence of correspondences. This is perhaps clearest in Hermeticism, where symbolical connections between the cosmos and human beings are referred to by the dictum, as above, so below. However, even in Gnosticism and Neoplatonism, there are associations or sympathies between lower realities, such as the embodied soul, often called the microcosm, and higher realities, for example the Pleroma and the World Soul, that are part of the macrocosm. Secondly, there is the related idea that a chain or hierarchy of being connects the microcosm and the macrocosm. 
Goodrick Clark calls this intermediary realm the mesocosm. Whatever it's called and however it's explained, it lies beneath certain theoretical notions, such as the notions of emanation and ascent of the soul that in different ways are expressed in both Gnosticism and Neoplatonism. But it also motivates some of the practices of Hermeticism. For example, consider that alchemical transmutation, whether of base metals into gold or of human souls into more enlightened entities, only makes sense in a system where lower realities are somehow connected to and can access or be transformed into higher realities. There's one additional feature that we should mention. It has to do with the meaning of the word esoteric itself. Etymologically, the prefix ESO has to do with something that is inside. From the standpoint of a given wisdom school, what's in view is an inner tradition that one must be initiated into in order to go from being an outsider to becoming a member of the inner circle. Let's do a quick review. Gnosticism and Neoplatonism are both theoretical systems, the former leaning more toward theology and the latter more toward philosophy. Hermeticism, on the other hand, is a cluster of practical disciplines. The Hermeticists need not be overly concerned with theories at all. Nevertheless, at a high level of abstraction, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, and Hermeticism arguably have a few things in common. Not least, they represent bodies of teaching that in some sense one has to be initiated into. And these similarities, considered generally, might be called esotericism. But these words, Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, and Esotericism are far from the only ones that might be encountered, or that might confound. We should also consider, number five, the related word, occultism. Denotatively, the word occult means concealed or hidden. It carries the sense of something transmitted or held in secret. It is arguable, therefore, that the words occult and esoteric are close cousins, even interchangeable. Moreover, connotatively, occult is sometimes made to refer to that which is forbidden. In this way, something occultic is concealed or obscured in virtue of its being on the dark side of things. Relatedly, it's sometimes also used as a way of labeling some belief or practice irrational. To confuse things further, there was a tradition of using the phrase occult sciences to designate those hermetic arts, alchemy, astrology, and magic, that constitute the three parts of the wisdom of the whole universe, according to the enigmatic alchemical text known as the Emerald Tablet. This would mean, therefore, that it is possible to employ occultism as a synonym for hermeticism. Keep in mind that our modern word, science, comes from the Latin scientia, which simply meant knowledge. Similarly, occultism may be thought of as practical esotericism. One cannot forget also that the late 15th to early 16th century natural magician and scholar Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa wrote a book published circa 1531 literally titled Occult Philosophy. These and other related uses show that the word certainly has a long pedigree. But the current academic usage of occultism is different than any of these. Nowadays, it has become standard to use the word as a technical term for the often bewildering varieties of esotericism that emerged specifically in the 19th century, first in France and then in America and Europe more broadly. One crucial early figure in this so-called occult revival is Alphonse Louis Constant, better known as Eliphas Lévy, whom we highlighted in a recent Top 10 video. In his 1856 book, Dogma and Ritual of High Magic, Lévy used the word occult or one of its cognates, dozens of times. Some of the most oft-used and pervasive references, at least in Arthur Edward Waite's English translation, talk of occult philosophy and occult understanding, as well as something Lévy deems occult science. In his native France, Lévy influenced Gérard Oncaza, also more commonly referred to by his assumed name, Papou. Papou was the founder of contemporary Martinism, a movement inspired by the obscure 18th century magician Martinez de Pascali. Lévy's vocabulary and thinking was transmitted into Anglo-American circles, for example via the aforementioned A. E. Waite, but also through British Orientalist Kenneth R. H. Mackenzie and later the previously named American Rosicrucian writer H. Spencer Lewis. Thus, similarly to Hermeticism, occultism has come to be partially associated with esoteric or high-grade Freemasonry, 19th century Rosicrucianism, and the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. 
But once again, things get confusing, not least because several of these occult currents, chiefly Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism, had earlier manifestations in the 17th and 18th centuries. Another confusion arises from the historical fact that this occult revival also affected a broader assortment of people than members of fraternal organizations and would-be ceremonial magicians. Lists vary, but the breadth of possibly relevant topics is remarkable. The phrase occult revival is also applied to Anglo-American mesmerism and various students of the paranormal, as those coalesced, for example, in movements like Phineas Parkhurst Quimby's New Thought, Mary Baker Eddy's Christian Science, Ernest Holmes' Religious Science, as well as in the Spiritism and Allied Spiritualism, about which we will have more to say in a moment. These would further develop into streams such as those launched by Norman Vincent Peale and William Walker Atkinson that assign significance to the, quote, power of positive thinking and to the so-called law of attraction. This would be picked up first by people like the 19th century American writer Prentice Mulford, who argued that thoughts are things, and later by the Australian television personality Rhonda Byrne. For example, in her 2006 book and video presentation, The Secret. The latter was hugely publicized by talk show guru Oprah Winfrey. Also in the mainstream, related concepts would give rise to mountains of self-help literature, motivational speeches, and life coaching that would make famous people such as Wayne Dyer, Tony Robbins, and podcaster John Jocko Willink. In various sales industries, there's a huge appetite for this sort of thinking, both for winning friends and influencing people, to echo the title of a sensational 1936 bestseller by author Dale Carnegie, and for excavating the so-called science of getting rich, as Wallace Waddles once put it. Here, names such as Bob Farrell, Joe Girard, Og Mandino, Bob Proctor, Zig Ziglar, Joe Jordan, and a host of lesser imitators produce a glut of material that never seems to satisfy the ravenous appetite of its audience. We shouldn't neglect to remark upon the seemingly ever-growing pan-religious attitudes, seeds of which were fertilized during the Second Great Awakening, and which would go on full display in the World Parliament of Religions at the World's Columbian Exposition held in Chicago, Illinois in 1893. This was the atmosphere in which H.P. Blavatsky's Theosophical Society would blossom and grow into a worldwide phenomenon seeking to fuse Eastern and Western forms of esotericism. And this is the backdrop for the religious pluralism and cultural relativism that became a fixture of Western society starting in the 20th century. Number six, mysticism. The word mysticism surfaced in conjunction with several systems of thought, for example, Neoplatonism, and with multiple individuals, such as Jakob Berma. By this point, I'm sure it won't surprise viewers to learn that mysticism has its own assortment of meanings. On the pejorative end of the spectrum, it is sometimes used as a term of disparagement for those ways of thinking, including some just surveyed, that are perceived by critics to be somehow insufficiently based on, or concerned with, evidence and reason. In this vein, and similarly to one of the popular level definitions for a cult, mystical becomes synonymous with words such as irrational, and is often contrasted with something like scientific. To add an additional layer of complexity, mystical can have the sense of secrecy, Earlier, we saw that the words esoteric and occult both could have something to do with things or information that is somehow hidden or secret. Now we see that mystical can fit into the same pattern. Moreover, both esoteric and mystic can refer to people who are privy to these secrets, for one of the meanings of a mystic is a person who is initiated. But mysticism is also a technical term in theology. In that field of study, which takes God or the divine as its subject, mysticism has to do with a kind of religious experience that is usually glossed as being a direct encounter with the divine. Like Hermeticism, which you'll recall picked out a trio of hands-on esoteric exercises or occult operations, mysticism is also essentially practical. The mystic is a person who does something. The mystic wants to have the mystical experience things further complicate at two interrelated levels, at least. Firstly, there may be wide and possibly system-dependent disagreement about the methods available to the mystic. This can be seen by contrasting the Neoplatonists Plotinus and Iamblichus. Arguably, 
both thinkers were philosophers who were concerned not only with talking about reunion with the one, but about achieving it as well. Nevertheless, at its most basic, we might say that Plotinus's approach was thoroughly contemplative, whereas Iamblichus was at least partially concerned with magic. The point is that within broadly the same system, in this case Neoplatonism, we have two figures who recommend different mystical methods, and this variation may appear within other mystical systems and in other religions as well. But secondly, there will be divergent and certainly system-dependent analyses of what exactly is happening during a mystical experience. To be sure, not every mystic is concerned with analysis at all. However, it is important to realize that variation does appear among practitioners. For instance, since Neoplatonism tends towards pantheism, it is natural to take a true experience of the One as a literal metaphysical union of the mystic with the Absolute. The mystic directly experiences the fact that reality is interconnected, continuous, and ultimately an emanation from the One. But not all mysticism need be understood as an absorption of a soul or spirit into the Divine. It is also possible to think of such experiences in more traditionally theistic terms, simply as the approach of a human being to a god that is ontologically distinct. The rub is that for certain writers, it is difficult to interpret just what sort of mysticism is being espoused or represented. For example, take the 13th to 14th century mystic known as Meister Eckhart. His language is susceptible to multiple interpretations. In one place, for instance, Eckhart declares, quote, When the divine light penetrates the soul, it is united with God as light with light. Now, Eckhart was a member of the Dominican religious order, the same order to which Thomas Aquinas belonged. So, some interpreters have concluded that Eckhart was a faithful Catholic, whose language, where potentially problematical, should be viewed as metaphorical or poetic. On this view, when Eckhart talks of the soul uniting with God as light with light, He's just using figures of speech to convey the intimacy of a meeting that could be reported in theologically orthodox words instead. On the other hand, other interpreters, such as the Franciscans who accused him of heresy, take Eckhart more literally. These people may point out that the light with light language suggests that both God and the soul are, so to speak, made out of the same stuff. In philosophical lingo, Eckhart seems to be saying that they share an essence or at least it may be suspected that the boundary between God and the soul is somehow obliterated. After all, when light mixes with light, it is not obvious that there remains any meaningful way of distinguishing the two lights afterward. Number seven, Kabbalism. Of course, while the Eckhart debacle took place in a Catholic context, it is necessary to acknowledge that not all mysticism has a Christian complexion. Many forms did or do have this orientation, such as the Catholic mysticism of St. Francis of Assisi and the religious order, the Franciscans, that bears his name, or the Lutheran mysticism of Johann Arndt and the German pietism that he helped to inspire. But there are innumerable sorts of mysticism that lie outside this framework, just as there were both Christian Neoplatonists, such as the 5th to 6th century Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite, as well as non-Christian Neoplatonists, like the 4th century Roman emperor known as Julian the Apostate. Two main streams of non-Christian mysticism, one of which we will do no more than simply list here, are those that exist in the other so-called great monotheistic religions, Judaism and Islam. To be sure, there are other sorts that grow out of Eastern religions, such as Buddhism and Hinduism, but here we will restrict ourselves to Western varieties of esotericism. Islamic mysticism, a main variety of which is called Sufism, will have to occupy us another time. For it is arguable that the tradition with the greatest impact on Western esotericism has been that which flourished within Judaism and whose main relevant current is referred to as Kabbalah or Kabbalah. A more detailed treatment of this complicated system may be forthcoming. Although we note that Kabbalah has interacted and intersected with Christianity, for the present, suffice it to say that it can be thought of as an outgrowth of the earlier Jewish mystical tradition known as Merkabah. Merkabah, which word means chariot, involves contemplation and attempted replication of a vision of God beheld by the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel, as recorded in the opening chapter of the biblical book bearing his name. In addition to this mystical strain, Kabbalah also evolved around cosmological speculations. For example, in the Sefer Yetzirah, that is the Book of Formation, the world is explained as having arisen from the Hebrew language. The 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet 
along with ten numerical correspondences referred to as Sephiroth, are described as comprising the, quote, 32 paths of wisdom by which God created the world. However, this basic framework would be developed by later writers. The Sefer Habahir, or the Book of Illumination, introduced a Hebrew version of the idea of divine illumination that we encountered first in our discussion of Neoplatonism, though in the Bahir the overall orientation is often said to be more reminiscent of Gnosticism. Perhaps the most important text in Jewish mysticism is the Sefer HaZohar, variously translated as the Book of Radiance or the Book of Splendor. The Zohar is actually a collection of texts rather than a single one, but in general terms, the Zohar offers allegorical or esoteric commentaries on the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, also collectively called the Pentateuch, or in some contexts, the Torah. The Zohar was first publicized in Spain by Rabbi Moses de Leon. For his part, de Leon credited the second century figure Shimon bar Yohai with its authorship, though modern scholarship largely discounts his claim. Regardless of its provenance, it unquestionably helped to shape Iberian Kabbalah, which in turn was imported into the Christian world, particularly after Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella expelled the Jews in the 15th century. Thereafter arose a stream of thought called Christian Kabbalah. In this tradition, people such as Pico della Mirandola and Johannes Reuchlin sought to show that esoteric Judaism and Neoplatonic Christianity could be seen as coinciding. Many of these theorists held to the Hermetic notion that there had once existed an ancient theology, or Prisca Theologia, that was the source for all subsequent religions, many of which had perverted its true doctrines. Another important development in Jewish esotericism occurred in the 16th century, when the rabbi Isaac Luria further embellished the ideas in these foundational Kabbalistic texts. Luria articulated a jargon-laced cosmogony, one that could be read as an attempt to reconcile the biblical story of creation with the esoteric concept of emanation. The overall system, known as Lurianic Kabbalah, has been influential for centuries, including exerting a profound effect on later Christian Kabbalists like Franciscus Mercurius van Helmont, Christian Noor von Rosenroth, and the pietist Swedenborgian Friedrich Christoph Edinger. In fact, Kabbalah generally has exerted a strong influence upon multiple Western groups, for example, fraternal organizations like Freemasonry. However, to many of its rabbinic advocates, the full exposition and presentation of Kabbalah has conventionally been reserved for insiders and specialists. Fast forward to 20th century America, where Rabbi Philip Berg's Los Angeles, California-based Kabbalah Center undertook the popularization of many basic Jewish esoteric concepts. Berg's efforts provoked strong reactions, both pro and contra, from more traditional practitioners. Still, before his death in 2013, Berg managed to attract A-list figures from the world of entertainment, including actors Milo Kunis, Ashton Kutcher, and Demi Moore, as well as pop singers like Britney Spears and Madonna. Number 8. Theosophy On the topic of movements that attracted celebrities, we may as well go on to briefly discuss Theosophy. Following its inception in 1875, it enticed literateurs and poets George William Russell and William Butler Yeats. It drew in Indian nationalists Gandhi and Nehru. Famed American inventor Thomas Alva Edison was reportedly a member, as was pioneering psychologist and philosophical pragmatist William James. One of the society's early presidents was the curious career military man Abner Doubleday, who, among other things, was once credited with the invention of the game of baseball. You will recall that we encountered the word theosophy previously. We noted that the Theosophical Society founded, or more precisely co-founded by Helena Blavatsky, was in part a restatement of Gnosticism that became a major tradition in the 19th century occult revival. But the word theosophy may be a bit tricky. In common usage, it refers to a syncretistic system of thought that Blavatsky herself pioneered in books such as Isis Unveiled and The Secret Doctrine. From here, things get a bit murky, however. Early on, her society, which was originally established in New York City, split. One co-founder, William Kwan Judge, remained in the United States, while Blavatsky herself, along with Henry Steele Alcott, moved to the city of Adyar in India. Additionally, following Blavatsky's death, British political activist Annie Besant and her associate, an ex-Anglican priest named Charles Webster Ledbetter, 
would modify some of the society's initial teachings, so much so that some of those wishing to remain loyal to their foundress would label Besant's and Ledbetter's variant doctrines Neo-Theosophy. The Theosophical Society also inspired the creation of other systems, which are sometimes also grouped under the heading Neo-Theosophy. This would include Rudolf Steiner's Anthroposophy, which word refers to human wisdom, and which goes back to the writings of the 16th century German magus Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa and the 17th century Welsh alchemist Thomas Vaughan. Amidst all the accretions and elaborations, there was also a push to return Theosophy back to Blavatsky. This movement was typified by the efforts of archivist and editor Henry Newland Stokes. However, viewers should also be aware that the same term, Neo-Theosophy, is sometimes applied to the writings of channeler and seminal New Age thinker Alice Bailey. Although she was affiliated with the Theosophical Society for a time, Bailey eventually broke with it and, with the backing of her second husband Foster, articulated her own form of esotericism. Similarly to Blavatsky, Bailey claimed to be in telepathic communication with an alleged Tibetan master. From these extrasensory dictations, Bailey derived a worldview that incorporated elements of esoteric astrology, Gnostic cosmology, Hermetic Kabbalah, and much else besides. Via Foster Bailey's loosest trust, Alice Bailey launched her arcane school, which has had a pronounced effect on Western versions of ceremonial magic, neo-paganism, the New Age movement, parapsychology, and various forms of psychic or energy healing, such as Reiki and Shiatsu. To help shed light on these intricate topics, I will be publishing numerous charts that are currently in development. Look for forthcoming advertisements. Although the word Theosophy is perhaps most frequently used as a proper name for Blavatsky and esotericism and its many offshoots, some of which were just rehearsed, there are two further complications. Number one, it turns out that there was a group calling itself the Theosophical Society roughly a century before the inception of its better known 19th century counterpart. The previous incarnation was formed in London by a group of English admirers of the 17th to 18th century Swedish mystic Emanuel Swedenborg. The Circle of Swedenborgians was instituted by James and Robert Hindmarsh and included British politician Charles Augustus Tulk, as well as artists John Flaxman and William Sharp. Number two, we observe that the word theosophy may also be used as a common noun. Strictly speaking, the word means the wisdom of God. Because of this, one sometimes encounters references to theosophy in regard to systems of thought and to thinkers that predate either Blavatsky's or Hindmarsh's societies. For example, historian Nicholas Goodrick Clark refers to both Hermeticism and Beminism as theosophical, even though the former may go back as far as Hellenistic Greece, or if you believe the legends, even earlier, and the German mystic Jakob Berma died in 1624. The previously named Lutheran Swedenborgian Friedrich Edinger is also routinely called a theosophist because of his attempts to fuse his Kabbalistic Christian mysticism with natural science. Furthermore, at least one online dictionary defines Kabbalah itself as, quote, an esoteric theosophy, or again, and as cursory visits to the relevant Wikipedia articles will reveal, Similar descriptions are sometimes applied to the spiritual tradition set in motion by the Dominican preacher Meister Eckhart and carried forward by Henry Suso and Johannes Tauler, and later the Protestant Valentine Weigel. The Theosophical Society itself could be considered an occult science institution, as two of its three objects, as articulated in the early 20th century, make clear. For more insight, check thesynchromystic.com for numerous free charts and check Amazon.com for expanded versions, your purchase of which helps fund content like this. My reference to a spiritual tradition segues us to our next word, number nine, spiritualism. Of course, the way I just employed it, spiritual simply means religious or church-related, but there are further, more specialized meanings that you should be aware of. One definition for spiritualism treats it as an antonym for philosophical materialism. We're not speaking here about a preoccupation with money and worldly goods in the way that the previously mentioned Madonna referred to herself as a material girl in a popular song from the 1980s. Crudely stated, materialism in our sense is the view that only matter exists. Materialism is often characterized as a modern revival of a philosophical doctrine called atomism, 
which owes its initial formulation to the ancient Greek thinkers Leucippus and Democritus. Modern materialism is attributed to the 17th century French Catholic astronomer and priest Pierre Gassendi, and is explicitly defended by his atheistic contemporary, the English political philosopher Thomas Hobbes. The idea that reality is exclusively made up of matter and not anything like mind or spirit became a powerful stream in some Enlightenment thinkers, for example, the French encyclopedists Denis Diderot and the Baron de Holbach. In protest of this sort of reductionism, there are those who believe in the separate existence of mind or spirit, as distinct from anything physical. In this broad way of speaking, spiritualism could be considered a way of referencing these anti-materialist perspectives. As such, the word would be a close cousin to idealism, panpsychism, romanticism, and so on. But as a technical term in the study of esotericism, the word spiritualism most often picks out something different. To get a fix on it, we have to go back to the 19th century occult revival that we discussed a few minutes ago. This sort of spiritualism has to do with so-called mediumship. This is the idea that certain attuned people, called mediums, are able to channel or otherwise communicate with the spirit world. For those who go in for it, this realm is usually thought of as populated with the souls of dead people. One practice, known as a seance, involves a group of participants sitting around a table. The medium attempts to establish the desired spirit contact, perhaps by entering into a trance, or by using various props, like the instrument that is now known as a Ouija board. Devotees hold that when a successful connection is made, the spirits frequently produce sense-perceptible evidence of their presence. These may come in the form of lights flickering or heard noises, such as table wrapping. Some mediums were believed to undergo physical changes during a spirit manifestation. An example of this is the alleged generation of a curious substance called ectoplasm, which was said to be the materialization of a spirit's energy, and which was used to hilarious comic effect in the 1984 movie Ghostbusters. Although there were antecedents, not least of which include the animal magnetism therapies of Franz Anton Mesmer and the mystical writings of Emanuel Swedenborg, spiritualism properly so-called is typically dated to the mid-1800s. At that time, numerous claimed mediums and spiritualists, including Kate, Margaret, and Leah Fox, as well as Cora L. V. Scott, achieved celebrity status. Some of them, for example, Andrew Jackson Davis, were even sought after as faith healers. Faith healing would later be integrated into Christian movements, such as those associated with Pentecostalism, positive confession, and so-called word of faith theology. For the interesting, if complicated, ways that faith healing connects to other esoteric and religious movements, see the free chart posted at thesynchromystic.com. However, for all its apparent novelty, spiritualism has been characterized as a warmed-over and Americanized version of Renaissance Neoplatonism, which system we touched on previously. As for the spiritualist movement, it had significant impact. For example, it impressed such notables as British story writer Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, and Mary Todd Lincoln, wife of the ill-fated 16th American president, Abraham Lincoln. Spiritualism carried over into the 20th century as well in figures such as the famed clairvoyant and New Ager Edgar Cayce, who during trance sessions often reported on the mysterious and possibly mythic lost continent of Atlantis. In some quarters, interest in a wide range of occult topics, including spiritualism, persists to the present day, as can be seen from the fact that booksellers like Amazon and Barnes & Noble continue to stock many relevant titles. And this brings us to the last word we'll tackle today, number 10, metaphysics. It is not at all uncommon to hear esoteric and paranormal-themed books, practices, and theories referred to as metaphysical. Examination of the word provides clues as to why. The prefix meta can be translated after or beyond. So it is natural to understand metaphysics as a discipline dealing with phenomena that somehow go beyond that of everyday mundane physical reality. Incidentally, this makes the word metaphysics a sometimes synonym for a cult, which latter can also refer to that which lies beyond the world of the ordinary or beyond the scope of scientific investigation. But the word metaphysics also shows up in academic contexts. Take note, students enrolling in a college metaphysics course should not expect to spend much time on auras or energy crystals. You see, in university parlance, metaphysics denotes a major branch of Western philosophy, sometimes alternatively labeled 
ontology. Other outstanding subdivisions of philosophy include epistemology, or the study of how and whether human beings can have genuine knowledge of anything, and ethics, or the study of moral decision-making, moral principles, values, and so on. In the field of metaphysics, one is concerned with abstract issues regarding existence. What sort of things exist? What does it mean for anything to be? What is the nature of causation? These are the sorts of questions about which the philosophic metaphysician will be preoccupied. At least, the metaphysician who has been trained in the main lines of what is termed the analytic philosophical tradition. However, in the case of the word metaphysics, the two definitions can dovetail in interesting ways. After all, whether spirits and other objects of occult speculation actually exist is a perfectly fair question to ask and the possible answers may be of interest to anyone who wishes to think seriously about them. Which is, in a way, what we have just been doing. And if you haven't guessed, such exercises are part of the ambition of this YouTube channel. Of course, we'll also be posting more Symbol Odyssey videos as well. But if, like us, you are also fascinated with topics like Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Spiritualism, and other avenues of occultism, then stay tuned for more. And please like the video, and subscribe to the channel.